Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Firstly, I would like to say my utmost gratitude towards Allah Subhanahu wa taala for letting us gather in today's seminar with a good and stable state of health. Before we start our seminar today, let us pray to Allah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Raditu billahi rabba wa bil islami dina wa bi muhammadin nabiyya wa rasula rabbi zirini ilma wa rizuhni fahma wa amalan salihan Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, very warm greetings to each and every one of you Welcome to Medical Science Seminar Series with a theme, Stay Hydrated, Stay Healthy I am Refika Salsabila, the master of ceremony of today's event, to guide you until the seminar end. On behalf of the organizing committee, we extend our appreciation to your, for your presence today. There will be an opening speech that will be given by Dr. Muhammad Edi Putra, ENT specialist, as the vice dean of UMSU. Please welcome Dr. Muhammad Edi Putra. ENT specialist. Um, zoom. Zoom. It is great pleasure for me to welcome you to the Medical Sciences Seminar series with them, Stay Hydrated and Stay Healthy. First of all, let us praise and thank to the presence of Allah Almighty and our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so we can still gather in this room without any barriers at all and in a good health. My name is Dr. Muhammad Edi Shahputra Dasutian, EN, ENT specialist, Vice Dean of Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Sumatra Utara. It is such an honor for me to speak here today. Thank you for Department of Nutrition who have prepared this seminar. My honorable to lectures a faculty of medicine, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Sumatra Utara. My honorable to our speakers, Dr. Eka Febrianti MGZ from Department of Nutrition, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Sumatra Utara. And also our special speaker from College of Health Solutions at Arizona State University, Mr. Steffers. A Kephoris PhD, FACSM, FACSS. Nice to meet you, Prof. And to all the participants, especially our beloved students, in today's seminar, we will discuss about water. One simple word, but has a big impact in our lives. As we know, that our body consists of 80% water. If you lack of water, it will have an impact in our health, especially in the summer. Indonesia, especially in Medan City, Medan is in North Sumatra, Prof. Medan is the capital city, capital city of North Sumatra. Jakarta is the capital city of Indonesia. And Medan and Jakarta are in Indonesia. Has recently, Medan City has recently reached 41 degrees Celsius and we will have summer next August. We have to prepare ourselves so that the body stay hydrated and stay healthy. And we will discuss it more detailed by the speakers. Well, I would, uh, I would not like to take too much of, our, of your time. Once again, thank you for our special speaker, Mr. Steffers from College of Health Solutions at Arizona State University. I hope one day we will meet again and make more collaborations. 
not only in this seminar, but also in other activities or other events, maybe. And that's all for me. Thank you for all participants attending the seminar. Stay hydrated and stay healthy. Walhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Eddy, for the opening speech. Well, this seminar will be divided into five segments. First, opening. Second, speaker's presentation. Third, discussion. And finally, closing. Without further ado, let's start this seminar, which is going to be led by Dr. Amelia Eka. Dr. Amelika, Amelia Eka, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Revika. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Medical Science Seminar Series, Faculty of Medicine, with Department of Nutrition, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Sumatera Utara. I will introduce myself first. My name is Amelia Ekadamayanti. I'm a Nutrition Department member in Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Sumatera Utara. And I will be your moderator for today's seminar. Uh, first, I would like to personally welcome to the Honorable Dr. Siti Masliana, ENT Specialist Consultant, as uh, Dean of Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Sumatera Utara, and also Dr. Nur Fadli, Master of Tropical Medicine, and Dr. Muhammad Edi Saputra Nasution, ENT Specialist, as a Vice Dean of Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Sumatera Utara. And then I would like to personally welcome to our honorable speaker for today's seminar, Professor Stavros Kapuras, and also Dr. Eka Febrianti. Uh, hello, Professor. Yes, I think it is 8 p.m. Uh, right now in Arizona, so good evening, Professor. We are so lucky and it's a pleasure to have you joining us in seminar today. And all for all uh, participants, welcome and thank you for joining us in Medical Science Seminar Series. Right, um, we have two speakers with two topics. First, the impact of water intake in health with Professor Kafuras, and second topic about water or fluid intake in hydration state with Dr. Eka Febrianti. Before we start our seminar, I will read the Professor Kurit Kulumvite first. Professor Kafuras is a professor of nutrition in and assistant dean of graduate education for the College of Health Solution at Arizona State University. He is the founding director of the Hydration Science Lab, which studies how water intake impacts health and performance. Dr. Kafuras is one of the top 2% of the world's most scientists, the author of more than 160 peer review articles, cited more than 10,400 times with its index 54, and has given lectures in 29 countries. His current research focused on hydration and glucose regulation, fluid composition of, for optimizing hydration and children's hydration and obesity. He is also the editor-in-chief of the hydration section for nutrients, a section editor of the European Journal of Nutrition, and associate editor of Frontiers in Nutrition. Professor Kafuras is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine and the European College of Sports Science and an elected member of the American Society of Nutrition, the Obesity Society, and the American Physiological Society. Okay, before we go into the presentation, I would like to kindly remind all the particip participants, if you have any question, please chat, please write in your chat box chat box and we will discuss it after discussion after presentation um, okay professor um, you have 40 minutes to present your presentation and time is yours thank you very much and uh, I really appreciate the invitation <clears throat> Indonesia is one of the 29 countries that I have given lectures in the past so um, I'm, I'm very excited to share with you some information 
about water intake and health. <clears throat> so we know that we're made mostly out of water, but also water seems to be the least studied topic in nutrition. And it's not only the least studied in nutrition, but if you look in dietary guidelines, like in the United States, we have the USDA that publishes those consumer-friendly dietary guidelines. Uh, water seems to have been forgotten since the very beginning when the first practical version of, of um, nutrition information was served back in 1947. It was also forgotten in 1956 when uh, they tried to simplify the guidelines into four basic categories. It was also forgotten in 1992 when the pyramid was first introduced uh, in the U.S. Um, with uh, on the top having things that you're supposed to consume the least and then on the bottom things that's supposed to be more uh, consumed in more servings and, and in more quantity. It was forgotten in 2005, and actually, when uh, when the first came out, I was excited for a second because I thought somewhere here there must have been some water, but I quickly realized that there was no place for water. There was milk, a glass of milk, and two containers with milk. <clears throat> and then in 2011, again, I got excited for a few seconds when I thought that this circle here was water, but quickly realized that uh, it wasn't. So I like to say that water is a forgotten nutrient and we have forgotten to use it in the dietary guidelines. It's forgotten to study it for many, many years and it's forgotten to talk about it many times. When you go to nutrition and biomedical conferences, uh, water is a topic that it is not discussed so easily. So today I'm going to, uh, cover a few topics, uh, trying to address how much we should drink and what are the dietary guidelines. And, and I will speak primarily to the dietary guidelines in the U.S. I, I'm aware that your uh, guidelines and your pyramid does include water, and I'm very proud for it, and I'm very happy that you do have a pyramid with water being the base. Uh, we will talk about um, is drinking to thirst the optimal way to stay hydrated? And we will also discuss what is the impact of underhydration and health. So does underhydration impact health? So how much we should drink? So I, I know if we look at the dietary guidelines across the globe, uh, first of all, we will very quickly realize that most countries do not have dietary guidelines. Then we will see that um, there is a large difference between different countries. For the purpose of, of this presentation, I will present the, the dietary guidelines that we have in the United States, and I will try to discuss and show you some data that I believe those guidelines seems to be fairly close to what probably we need to stay adequately hydrated. Um, and I understand this is a big table. I took this table from the, the DRIs from uh, different nutrients. So let's pay attention to uh, this part right here, which is, <clears throat> uh, give me one second, here we go. So this, what, this place right here is the total water intake per day across many different age groups. So you will see that for adult males, that number, the total water intake per day, it's, it's 3.7 liters. And for adult females, this number is 2.7. Of course, there are different requirements for uh, different people. So for example, during pregnancy, uh, the total water intake requirement is higher. During lactation is significantly higher, more than one liter greater than the 2.7. So yes, there are changes across genders. And yes, there are changes across age groups and of course, in different stages like pregnancy or lactation. So one thing that I would like to clarify from the beginning of the presentation is uh, what we mean when we say total water intake guidelines and, and what we mean when we say how much water you're supposed to drink. So water is a particular case because we have water, what they call the nutrient, 
So the molecules of water that we can consume from many different ways, and we also have water, the food, or plain water, something that we can drink from tap if it is safe, or bottled water if tap water is not safe. So uh, this is the only probably nutrient that it exists as a food, like there is no food vitamin C, there is no food biotin, there is no wa- no food dietary fiber, but there is food water, which is either bottled water or tap water, and there is a nutrient, which is called water. So when we talk about the dietary reference intakes and the dietary guidelines, we refer to the total amount of water that we consume. And that water comes primarily as a beverage, so from different drinks. So most of it, for most countries, seems to come from plain water and and water coming from all sorts of other beverages, teas, coffee, um, et cetera. And of course, water that we consume through solid food. And in this image, I have primarily fruits and vegetables, just because fruits and vegetables seems to be much higher in water content than other solid food. But remember, there is water pretty much everywhere. So we eat, uh, let's say, uh, meat or bread or rice or pasta. Everything has water. Of course, not as much water as, let's say, cucumber, for instance, which is nearly 90% water. So um, I'll present you in the presentation uh, some information about how much uh, water Americans consume, uh, what is dehydration versus underhydration, and I will try to make that distinction, and what is the impact of underhydration on health. So let's start with how much people drink. A- and I use the data from the United States because those uh, data are very well studied over the years. We have Uh, representative studies from the National Health and Nutrition Examinations Survey. And and those data do exist across many different groups, and and they've been collected for many years. So let's start from uh, uh, data from adults in the United States. Those are from NHANES, the the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, 2005-2010. And this is what they found. They found that 75 to 84% of total water intake, this is what TWI means, comes from either plain water or water included in beverages. So whatever goes, I would say, to simplify in a glass, whatever we drink in a glass, it's, it contributes approximately between 75 to 84%. Um, contribution of food, so whatever goes in a plate, uh, is between 17 to 25% of total water intake. And actually what is interesting, and there are some good data from, from Indonesia that indicate people that they consume higher percent of water from food are usually people that they consume very little water. So they don't drink too many fluids. So the water that comes from food and beverages percentage-wise has higher contribution. Plain water intake, so plain water is water coming either from tap or from bottled water with 30 to 37%, depends on the age group. And tap water was the primary source, at least in the United States, 56%. Bottled water was 44% within the plain water intake category. So about close to equal distribution between tap water and bottled water. Um, Also, there were some... Um, ethnic disparities between non-Hispanic whites that they tend to consume more water than anybody else in the United States. And and that reflects to a good extent the socioeconomic status. So people that they seem to be in a higher socioeconomic status tend to consume more tap water and they tend to trust more the tap water versus um people with lower socioeconomic status. And also Mexican-Americans in the United States uh, consumed more bottled water. So moving on uh, a little bit more analysis from the same data, I want to draw your attention in those two columns, the one right here and the one right here. So those columns, all of them represent water intake. This age group 
here it's 71 years old plus 20 to 50 51 to 70 but if you look specifically in this category of older adults this top portion of the bar represents what they say here shortfall so how much less they consume compared to what they're supposed to consume according to the guidelines so the 1218 means 1218 mls below the dietary guidelines and about 600 ml below the dietary guidelines so 83 percent of women and 96 percent percent of men over 71 year old failed to meet the dietary guidelines and and this average value was about 600 ml so more than two glasses of water below for women and more than about uh, uh five glasses of water for men If you look more carefully, the energy, the caloric contribution on different age, age groups, you will see that this is the number of calories contributed uh, coming from drinks. And drinks could be milk, soda, alcoholic beverages, fruit juice, uh, fruit drinks, tea, coffee, and energy or sport drinks. Um, the, the, the total energy intake coming from liquid from beverages was about 500 for younger people up to 50 years old and slightly lower for older people if you look more careful you see that soda seems to be the main uh the higher contributor with alcohol at least for for younger people 20 to 50 years old and um oh, sorry and for older people it seems to be milk and and dairy drinks um were the first contributor of total caloric intake. Moving on to similar analysis from the same data and actually from the same group of scientists from, uh, from University of Seattle, uh, we have data from four to 13 years old. So this is what they found from the United States again, that in kids four to 13, they tend to consume 70 to 75% of total water intake from uh, either plain water or beverages, 25 to 30% of total water intake comes from food. So a little bit higher contribution of food in total water intake. And probably since kids consume more creams, maybe more soups and more fruits and vegetables, then that might be the, the main um, uh, contributor from solid food. Uh, tap water in the U.S. was about 60% versus bottled water was about 40% for the plain water intake. And then similar data, I would say, with the adults as far as uh, Hispanic, non-Hispanic whites consuming more water and Mexican-Americans consuming more bottled water. So one thing that is very interesting, if you look at different age groups, so uh, here you can see the volume, how much they're drinking. Uh, the red data is the shortfall, how much they're not consuming or what is the average uh, how the average consumption, how many ml is below the recommendation. And, and here in this diagrams, you can see the percent of kids that they are below the dietary guidelines, the ones that they fail to meet the dietary recommendations, 75%, 83%, 85%. Um, and, and, and it seemed that most of those, uh, uh, the the boy seems to be more uh, uh consuming less water like 85 percent versus 83 for girls for uh for the older group so in in a different study based on the same cohort again from the Haines data from the national survey they took data from 2009 to 2012 and they were looking now instead of just water intake they were looking at urine biomarkers and trying to assess hydration. So not only how much they drink, but how hydrated they were. So one thing that they um, summarized from the study, it was that uh, more than 50% of kids were underhydrated based on very concentrated urine. Uh, one in four kids, they never consumed plain water. So there was no water coming water as as the food as plain food either bottle or tap water 
one in four children were not consuming any water, and three out of four children consuming more than one serving of sugary drink. So sweeten, uh, sugar sweetened beverages. So uh, sodas like Coke, Pepsi, uh, Seven Up, etc., or uh, uh, sugar enriched uh, juices or anything that has added sugar. So, um, so that is something that we should take into consideration when we think about contribution of uh, calories coming from the sugary drink. Um, it's interesting when we look at this data and we, and we pay closer attention, uh, we, we see that 54% of those kids, more than 50% we said earlier, uh, that percent was higher in kids that they were uh, uh, African-American or black kids. Uh, the percent of underhydration was higher in compared to younger children. Um, and it was higher in boys than in girls. And they also calculated that if these kids were consuming one glass of water more per day, uh, the association between water uh, will contribute to a significantly lower risk of inadequate hydration or underhydration. So let's move into underhydration and health. So I would like to make one clarification before we go farther in this presentation. So when I'm referring to underhydration, I'm trying to separate the condition of what we call dehydration or clinical dehydration. So when somebody suffers from clinical dehydration, then we have a medical uh, condition where most of the time needs to be addressed in the hospital. So you have to have either intravenous rehydration or you have to have, you know, very specific oral rehydration solution to have um, rapid rehydration and to address uh, that water deficit. Underhydration on the other side, it's a condition where people are consuming very small amount of water and your body is understanding that you're not consuming enough water and your body responds to it and even potentially without really having a very significant water deficit or clinical dehydration. So, so before I go um, into this concept and explain it a little bit farther, I would like to explain how body water is regulated. So uh, thirst and drinking is the, are the, the main regulators of, of hydration. And thirst is stimulated primarily by two different type of receptors. Uh, the receptors that we call osmoreceptors, and they're activated by uh, decreasing water intake in plasma. So those receptors, when we don't drink enough and our blood gets a little bit more concentrated, osmoreceptors get activated and, and we get thirsty. Similarly, when we lose water from, uh, from the blood, from plasma, then the barrier receptors get activated and we also get thirsty. At the same time, though, both of those signals stimulate this hormone that is called arginine vasopressin or also known as antidiuretic hormone. So what this hormone does, it decreases urination. So it decreases urinary output by primarily increasing water reabsorption through the nephron of the kidneys. So as a response, we produce less urine and we produce very concentrated urine. So when we go to the bathroom, we see that our urine is darker and also we don't need to go to the bathroom that often. This is a clear indication that arginine vasopressin is stimulated. We also know that the barrier receptors activate a series of metabolic reactions. We have an increase in angiotensin II that stimulates aldosterone and then aldosterone on its, uh, uh, the action of aldosterone, one of the main actions of aldosterone is to decrease um, sodium excretion via the urine. So we decrease what we call natriuresis. So we are urinating less sodium and by holding more sodium, then you can hold more fluids. So this is a very simplified way to, to present how thirst 
and water is regulated. And I would like to draw your attention primarily in this hormone where I'm trying to make a case about the impact of vasopressin. So let's see how vasopressin is secreted. We said, we said that the main signal for vasopressin is osmolality. And there is a nice linear relationship between plasma osmolality versus plasma vasopressin. And if you look at the literature, it seems that the risk relationship seems to be fairly linear. On the other side, we have thirst. The thirst is also uh, linearly associated with plasma osmolality. So the higher plasma osmolality, the higher is the thirst. One interesting thing is that if we put those together, the plasma osmolality versus vasopressin here on the left and thirst on the right, we very quickly realize that there is a difference between the threshold by which each one of those responses get initiated, what we call the, the osmotic threshold for vasopressin to increase, it's much lower than the osmotic thirst threshold for thirst. That's why many times when, when we, we heard the expression or people say, by the time you're thirsty, then you are already probably dehydrated, or you have a significant water deficit. Your body really needs water. So, so the take-home message from this is that your body responds almost immediately when plasma osmolality increase and it stimulates vasopressin. However, it allows your body to operate well without being very thirsty. And this is because when we get very thirsty, then it's very difficult to, uh, to function. So water and drinking is what we call motivated behavior. And as a motivated behavior, uh, it's able to weigh the need for water against other competitive survival demands. So the priority of our body is not to be optimally hydrated for optimal health and performance, but rather to be able to survive when water is not available. And this is a very interesting theoretical study from a group of anthropologists where a few years ago in, in 2020, they published this paper trying to explain how much dehydration could persist. You know, thousand years ago, people that that live in this planet, the Homo erectus, uh, that they calculated that Homo erectus could walk for up to five and a half hours without water and sustain dehydration up to minus 10% of body weight, which is minus 10%, especially if we talk about um, health function and exercise performance. We're talking about a very, very significant degree of dehydration uh, with strong clinical impact. And, and just to give you a perspective, when we lose about 12, 13, maybe 14% of body weight due to dehydration, we're, we're, we're getting into the threshold of people usually die as a response to excessive dehydration. So people can sustain dehydration and they can function uh, by being able to have a significant amount of dehydration and, and being able to walk without water for a long time. So this is what I call survival. So the question is, do we want to survive or do we want to be optimally uh, healthy and being able to perform um, at a high level? So, so let me go back to this diagram that I spoke earlier and, and discuss this difference in the threshold of vasopressin versus thirst. So if you look carefully, what it means is that our body allows us to have elevated vasopressin without being thirsty. And if we look actually carefully, we can see that in this range that I call the range of underhydration is the place where our body can have significantly elevated vasopressin uh, to a level somewhere between from three all the way to maybe 12 uh, picograms per ml. So I'll come back to that diagram in a little bit after I'll show you some data. Uh, this is a very interesting study where they took uh, what we call high 
and low drinkers. So they took 250 people, they selected the 50 higher drinkers and the 50 lower drinkers. So the two extremes of this side, the people that they like to drink a lot of water, the ones that they want to be well hydrated, optimally hydrated, and then the people that they usually report that they don't like to drink water, they don't drink that much water, and, and we call them in the literature low water drinkers. So they found they had two significant observations. One of them, and, and one which is very important for this conversation, is that vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone was significantly elevated in the low drinkers. And interestingly, also plasma cortisol was significantly elevated. So uh, by now, there are a lot of data that's showing even if you are just underhydrated, you're running into a risk of developing kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, longevity, believe it or not, mood, cognitive performance, social behavior, and of course, exercise performance. There are lots of data on exercise performance. And purposefully today, I was not planning to go into the exercise performance literature. But of course, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain that. Uh, this is a relatively recent study from the National Institute of Health uh, from the United States, the Center of Disease Control and Prevention from the US CDC. They presented this study where they saw that suboptimal hydration uh, remodels metabolism and promotes degenerative degrees and even shortens life. So very powerful data. So let me show you a few evidence as far as how high water intake versus low water intake could be associated with, with different disease and, and different health conditions. So here we have data from uh, a, uh, an Australian cohort, Giovanni Stripoli did a study in Australia, and he, he showed that higher fluid intake is associated with lower risk for chronic kidney disease. And, and here are the data, actually. He took the higher group, the I'm sorry, the lower group, the one that they were consuming on, on average, the medium value, uh, about 1,800 ml, 1.792 liters, and found that uh, when he compared between the, the higher percentile, the higher uh, quartile, actually here, uh, the ones that they were quintile, to be precise, I'm sorry, um, that they were consuming around three liters of water. Uh, those had um, uh, a smaller percent of people with GFR below 50%, and they were the ones that they were significantly lower, statistically significantly lower risk of developing chronic kidney disease. Uh, we also did a study, we took patients with uh, recurrent uh, history of kidney stones with recurrent urolithiasis, um, and, and we collected data and, and we analyzed for what is called crystallization index, uh, also known as Tizelius crystallization index, which is very well established as a risk for crystallizing kidney stones. And we found that the higher the urine osmolality, so the more concentrated the urine, the higher the risk for crystallization. We were also able to develop cutoff values for what it is considered optimal levels or thresholds for urine osmolality. And we found around 500 for women, a little bit higher, 570 for men, seems to be the threshold below which that threshold, the risk of crystallization is really, really low. So when urine is concentrated and urine osmolality is above this value, then you're running into a high risk of uh, creating more kidney stones. Another topic which is very interested, and I've been studying the last few years, is the impact of low water intake on hyperglycemia and diabetes. So in this study, they collected data from uh, about 3,500 uh, men and women in France, and they followed them up for nine years. So this is their conclusion. They found that low water intake was inversely and independently associated with risk of developing hyperglycemia. So very interesting data. One of the first studies back in 2011, 
However, they didn't really have any assessments or any other measurements that they could really explain what, what is happening. <clears throat> Uh, they speculated, of course, that vasopressin that seems to have receptors in, in the liver and the pancreas and in many other areas in the body might be the reason. So we collected uh, data from patients with type 2 diabetes. We brought them in the lab in two separate occasions. We test them where they were euhydrated and we test them when they were hypohydrated. And we did um, an oral glucose tolerance uh, test. So we cut them off their medication. And, and one of the interesting things, other than showing that uh, reduced water intake, it deteriorate, it creates even higher levels of glucose during an oral glucose tolerance test. We also found very interestingly that when they were hypohydrated, their plasma cortisol was significantly higher uh, during the oral glucose um, challenge. And, and somebody might wonder why cortisol, why, what cortisol has to do with water. So if you look how cortisol is secreted, usually cortisol is secreted through CRH. CRH stimulates ACTH from the anterior pituitary gland, and then ACTH will stimulate the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. However, vasopressin can also stimulate ACTH. So vasopressin is secreted from the posterior pituitary, can stimulate ACTH, which is uh, the next door neighbor anterior pituitary hormone. And then ACTH can be stimulated and produce cortisol. What is very interesting in this pathway is that cortisol can have a negative feedback on CRH to decrease ACTH and cortisol. However, vasopressin does not get blocked by cortisol. So when somebody is constantly on elevated vasopressin, this cycle, it keeps working nonstop. So uh, people that they consume a small amount of water, they have high vasopressin and they seem to have chronically elevated cortisol. And cortisol, which is another lecture to, to talk about the impact of cortisol on health, Cort cortisol seems to be linked with other than stress and anxiety, of course, it's, it's linked to cardiovascular disease, glucose dysregulation by itself, as well as obesity and, and, and other chronic disease. So one very interesting study was this study from um, um, Ola Melander's group and Sophia and Horning was the first author from, uh, from Sweden, from the Malmo Medical School, where they collected copeptin data, and they found um, high copeptin was associated with three to four times increased risk for, high, for diabetes. So, so what is copeptin? Copeptin is a lignin molecule in the production of vasopressin. So when somebody is producing one ml of vasopressin, is also producing one ml of copeptin. So copeptin is a molecule in the pre-pro-vasopressin production pathway. And, and we think that copeptin is inactive. We don't think that copeptin really does anything other than being a lignal molecule. So when we measure copeptin, it's pretty much like measuring vasopressin. So one ml of copeptin or one millimole of copeptin is one millimole of vasopressin. And we measure copeptin because it is easier to measure and it's very, very stable molecule. So pay attention here in this diagram that, that we saw earlier. So we said that when you're not thirsty, but your body knows that you need more water, your plasma vasopressin is elevated. So look at the levels of this vasopressin. Does it look similar to these levels? So over six or over 10? So definitely you could be living in this stage with elevated vasopressin, which it leads to three to four times increased risk for, for diabetes, an increase in risk, which is probably equivalent to the risk of obesity for diabetes. So moving on to a little bit more mechanistic work, this is a study that was done from a French group where they measure uh, the impact 
of vasopressin on, on diabetes and glucose intolerance. So this is what they did. They took mice, they either inject them with vasopressin for four weeks, or they, they make them drink more water for four weeks. And this is the control trial. So the rats that they were drinking more water, they were able to decrease their fasting glycemia, so their fasting blood glucose decreased. The ones, however, that they were getting a vasopressin injection for four weeks, they developed hyperglycemia within two weeks, and that was much higher within four weeks. So high vasopressin induced hyperglycemia and diabetes, while high water intake was associated with lower fasting glucose. What is even more interested is this data right here from the same study. They took also Zucker obese rats and they inject them with um, vasopressin receptor blocker. So the data on the black graph are the baseline, the control data for glucose, and this is for insulin. And then the data, the white data here are the data as a response to vasopressin blockage. So this is during a glucose injection test for two hours. And look what happened. When they block uh, the action of vasopressin by blocking the V1A receptor, which is a selective receptor in the pancreas and in the liver, they were able to improve gly glycemic response and, and suppress insulin action. So we saw all this data and we decided to do a, um, a, 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 clinical, a, a clinical crossover trial. And we took 60 subjects, uh, healthy 30 to 55 year olds, adults with normal uh, HbA1c. Um, we measure people with normal BMI or people that they were overweight or obese. And, and this is what we did. Look at this diagram down here. We did uh, two hours of either isotonic saline infusion, that was the control, or hypertonic saline infusion, 3% of sodium chloride. And then we did an oral glucose tolerance test for four hours. So, so look what we found. We found that when the subjects were doing first the hypertonic saline infusion, uh, and hypertonic saline stimulates acutely vasopressin. So we did the hypertonic saline to stimulate vasopressin. We were able to see significantly higher blood glucose, even though at zero time, the subjects were consuming exactly 75 grams of glucose. And also we saw that insulin response was a little bit suppressed as a response of, um, uh, of the elevated vasopressin. So, so we suggested that the osmotically stimulated vasopressin in per glucose regulation. Of course, there are lots of data in the literature and not only for glucose, but for many other aspects of health, like things even related to mood. And for some reason, it seems when somebody gets cellular dehydration, um, it has a strong negative impact in mood and that impact seems to be greater in women. <clears throat> um, we've also seen data, uh, again, those are some data also published from the National Institute of Health. They found that under hydration and low water intake that leads to high normal sodium uh, levels is a risk for accelerated biological aging, chronic disease, and premature mortality. Uh, we also study, we took data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, and we found that underhydration is associated with obesity, chronic disease, and even deaths um, in, in adults of 51 to 70 years old. So let me speak a little bit about this study, actually, that we published a few years ago now, about five years ago. We studied the impact of hypohydration on cardiovascular health. And we wanted to see what is the acute impact by assessing flow-mediated dilation. So we test the same people twice, once when they were euhydrated or when they were hypohydrated. 
And we found that low water intake decrease uh, flow-mediated dilation, which is a very objective way to assess um, cardiovascular health. So it shows pretty much the elasticity of the arteries when you do that test of uh, occlusion and, and uh, reperfusion test. So going back to the question then, how much we should drink if, if it seems that even being a small drinking seems to be a really has seems to have a very negative impact on health. So, so this is what we did. We took data from uh, men and women, uh, about one hundred, a little bit more than one hundred adults. We measure objectively how much water they were drinking by using deuterium oxide, and then we took uh, hydration biomarkers by twenty-four hour urine sample. And these are the data that we found. We found that for optimal hydration, women supposed to drink 2.4 liters per day. This is total water intake and men 3.6 liters per day. So let me remind you what are the, the National Academy of Medicine is the scientific organization that published the dietary guidelines in the US. The guidelines in the US are 2.7 and 3.7 which is really, really close to what we came up with our calculations. So if you look at these numbers, and if you say that 80% comes from beverages, which is the grand majority of the fluids, this is approximately 2.1 liters and 3.0 liters for women and men respectively per day. This is, this is total water intake coming from drinks, which is equivalent of eight glasses per day for women and 12 glasses of water uh, per day for men. So uh, two points to make. Number one, it's not that far away. I would say what, what the dietary guidelines recommend, it seems to be fairly close to what we found with, uh, with, with our precise uh, approach. And, and if you want to, uh, to use a simple way to assess whether you're drinking enough, uh, and whether you're well hydrated, because sometimes you might be, you know, uh, very physically active, or now you mentioned that the temperatures already are warming up significantly, and you might need more water. You can use one of those uh, very simple biomarkers, actually, that we came up with. So we figure out that if we combine urine color and void numbers, so how many times you go to the bathroom, and how dilute is your urine, you should be able to assess fairly precisely how well hydrated you are. So for adults, we found that if you pee at least seven times per day, and if your urine is light color, like three or lower in the eight color scale, um, then it seems that you're pretty much the, the possibility of being well hydrated, it's about 100%, so it's pretty accurate, especially when you combine both of them together. You have very high um, predictive ability based on sensitivity and specificity. And in children, the numbers were about five times per day and uh, urine color, again, uh, like three or lower. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Kafuras, for giving us information. Uh, it's very insightful and it's very useful because now it's summer here. Okay, uh, so for the next session, uh, we will have Q&A session. Uh, I will check the uh, chat box. Professor, uh, there's a question. The first one is coming from Dr. Pinta. Uh, thank you, Professor Stavros, for interesting presentation. I'm Dr. Pinta. I'd like to ask about whether someone who have had thyroidectomy, thyroid or parathyroid removal, there will be change in the fluid feelings in the body and how to recover the change. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very, That's very interesting, interesting question. question. To, 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 to be perfectly, perfectly honest, honest, I'm not, I'm not aware, aware of any uh, data, data looking, looking specifically, specifically for uh, thyroid, thyroid removal, removal 
uh, uh, like thyroidectomy and, and whether that impacts hydration and, and whether they're very specifically, I would say, different uh, water needs. Um, uh, depends. Usually in those cases, there is replacement by external uh, hormonal medication. So depends of, of whether the, metabol the metabolic rate is altered, then you might have small changes. I would say the, the best advice I can give is uh, use simple biomarkers like the ones that I propose at the end of my presentation. So um, the the seven going to the bathroom at least seven times per day, actually, if you think of it, instead of counting how many times did I go to the bathroom today, you can, if you do the math, how many hours we are awake, um, it means that we supposed to go to the bathroom every three hours. If we're not going to the bathroom every three hours, it means we're not drinking enough. Uh, so that's a very simple way to get an idea. And of course, urine color could be used um, in addition to that to uh, to to help. Um, uh, some cases that things get a little bit more complicated. It's it's with with Ramadan, uh, with when during Ramadan when during fasting then things can get a little bit more complicated. Of course, if you're not drinking anything, you're not going to be going to the bathroom every every three hours. So you have to make some adjustments, how much you can drink at, towards the end of the day and not to over drink that much that then you cannot sleep at night because you, know, you, you have to get up multiple times to go to the bathroom. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. Dr. Pinta, have any question more? Okay. Uh, for next question, come from Dr. Eka Febrianti. Uh, Professor Kafras, thank you for a great explanation. I'd like to ask about alcohol consumption. Can alcohol, can alcohol and caffeinate, caffeinate uh, drinks be counted as fluid to meet the fluid needs while they have a diuretic effect? And uh, there's explanation about relationship bet uh, between unhydrated and difficulty losing weight. Uh, professor? Thank you. Thank you. Those are very important questions. So let's start from the first one. So uh, I'll start from the easier one, which is alcohol consumption. So alcohol is a diuretic. So alcoholic beverages um, do not count towards water intake. So you cannot hydrate by drinking, I don't know, beer or wine or whatever. Um, um, alcohol has a, di a strong diuretic effect. So um, if you drink alcoholic beverages, then you lose more fluid. So um, I would not call it a, a good way to stay hydrated. Um, as far as caffeinated drinks, so coffee, uh, teas or other drinks um, that contain caffeine. Caffeine has um, has very bad reputation as being a diuretic, which is actually not the case until it reaches very high levels of caffeine consumptions. So uh, both uh, my lab and, and other scientists around the world have done studies and they have shown that moderate consumption of caffeinated drinks, they don't dehydrate it. They don't dehydrate. And there seems to be a threshold. So if you consume more than five to six, uh, more than more, definitely more than 400 milligrams of caffeine, then you start having diuretic effect. So it seems up to 400 milligrams, uh, caffeine doesn't seem to have a, a diuretic effect. And, and to give you some understanding what it means, 400 milligrams, so a regular cup of coffee, uh, even a strong cup of coffee, it, it has, let's say, roughly 100 milligrams of caffeine. So to reach more than 400 milligrams, it means that you should have four or five glasses of, of dark, you know, uh, strong coffee back to back. Uh, to be able to reach that level. Right. Um, I can go on on the second part of the question, which is under hydration and, and weight loss. So so this, this is a very interesting topic, actually, and, and there, are, there is a lot of scientific interest. And um, 
I'm personally uh, involved in this type of studies, trying to see whether, um, to, to give you a little bit of the bigger picture, whether there is a crosstalk between thirst and hunger, and whether being thirsty can many times be perceived as hunger and, and people consume more food just because they're thirsty and the other way around. Um, uh, there are some preliminary data. There are some preliminary data indicating also that vasopressin might uh, decelerate metabolism. Um, however, most of the review papers and, and the systematic reviews, they do not show that, that low water intake by itself has a negative impact on, uh, on losing weight. On the other side, um, what happens when you consume more water, if we talk about plain water, drinking more plain water, it seems to decrease the caloric intake of, of drinks that contain sugar, higher sugar. So by drinking more plain water, you end up consuming less sugary drinks, so less caloric drinks. So if this is the case, then you could have an impact on uh, on body weight regulation and diet and uh, and obesity. There was a, a very interesting study that was published almost ten years ago now, where they did a large intervention in the New York City schools, and they increased access to water by having water jets or or the newer type of of filtered water stations where kids go with their water bottles and they fill it up and they drink. And they found that when they did that intervention with increasing access to clean water in children, they found that the BMI in children decreased significantly as a response of installing just water fountains. So, so there is this, it seems that there is something there. It's not very much studied. Um, but it's something I would say that we don't right now we don't have very strong data to be very definitive about the topic. Okay, right. Thank you, Professor. Um, for the last question, maybe uh, how the strategies if we if we found uh, for a long hours to fasting, Prof. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, we have twelve to four. 14 uh, hours to fasting, and then we have a uh, uh, left we breakfast. Uh, in another country, we know that uh, they have until uh, 18 to 20 hours maybe to fasting. And we know that uh, they have just uh, several hours to breakfast, and we know uh, they, they, they use it for uh, sleep time. So how the strategy to uh, fulfill the water intake, Prof? Yeah, th this is, um, I'll be perfectly honest, it's, it's a difficult, it's a very difficult question and it's a, it's a difficult uh, uh, problem to address. One thing that I would like to, to draw your attention to it is, uh, of course, when, there, when you fast for so many hours, the thirst uh, signal is very activated. So you're definitely thirsty. So there is no problem of having people to drink. Uh, one thing that I would like to draw your attention is the choice of fluids that you use for rehydration after prolonged fasting, whether it is 14 hours or 20 hours, is there are studies that indicate that when you do dehydration, and so you get over 20 hours, you get a little bit dehydrated. So when you do this dehydration rehydration cycle, um, I would highly recommend to rehydrate with with plain water. At least the first um, exposure to to fluid should be water, and of course it's you know you fast from water and food, so you follow with food, etc. So you take electrolytes and other nutrients that you need through your food. Um, there are data indicating that if you rehydrate with, especially with drinks that are very high in fructose, particularly fructose, fructose seems to have um, a detrimental effect on kidney health. So fructose creates um, 
uh, at local toxicity in the nephrons that when you recurrently doing this uh, dehydration and rehydration your fructose and dehydration rehydration your fructose you're exposing especially your kidneys for for chronic kidney disease and and kidney issues so so my suggestion would be primarily try to avoid uh having drinks that are high in fructose so one of the juices that they're very high in fructose even from natural juices is the the apple juice actually it's high in fructose and of course um i'm i'm suspecting that in indonesia the high fructose corn syrup it doesn't exist like we have unfortunately in the united states that we use it as a a, a cheap a, inexpensive and subsidized sweetener for all the drinks um uh, and 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 so most of the drinks are enriched with fructose unfortunately which has a very negative effect um our body can also produce fructose so your kidneys can make fructose and and that fructose actually it's it's very bad as well so my main suggestion would be like try to rehydrate with water when you when you break fast drink water eat your meals and if you want to have juice or something else do it uh, consume it a little bit lighter uh i think it's a uh, last question and thank you very much for your great presentation and for our discussion now uh, we can take a photo session first uh I will remind to all participants to open your camera because we are take a photo with a speaker. Okay, maybe admin can take a photo. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you once again, uh, Professor Kafaras. Uh, yes, I think it is late night in Arizona now. You may can leave uh, the Zoom meeting and uh, hopefully we can meet with you and uh, hope you can join for our seminar session, especially about hydration. Professor, thank you for your time and thank you thank for you. your thank presentation. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, Profesor. Good night and have a nice rest, Profesor. And, and if, if there are any questions, please feel free to send me an email. I'll be happy to answer if you have any more questions that you might think later on. Okay, I will send you the email, Thank Professor. You. Yes. Thank bye you, bye. Professor. Bye. Good night. Yeah. Uh, okay, for next session, uh, we move to second speaker with Dr. Eka Febrianti with topic water or fluid in health uh, with okay sorry with second topic is about water or fluid intake in hydrogen state uh, before we go to uh, next presentation with Dr. Eka Febrianti, I will read the doctors Eka CV. Dr. Eka is uh, one of lecture uh, in nutrition department in Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Muhammadiyah Sumatera Utara. They birth on uh, in Solo on 4, 4, 4 February 1989. Um, Dr. Eka is uh, speaker. Next in our seminar, Dr. Eka, uh, I think you have 40 minutes for your presentation and time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks to Dr. Amelia Eka for the opportunity today. Uh, I feel very honored to sh to share my presentation about water or fluid intake and hydration state. Next.
before. Okay, water is the largest component in our body. At birth, uh, it is 75 to 85% of total uh, body weight. And in adult, it is uh, decreased about 60 to 70% of total body weight. But in obese people, uh, it is lower, it just 45 to 55% of total body weight. So age and body fat affect the total water in our body. Total body water is mainly distributed in the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. Intracellular fluid is contained within cell and extracellular fluid is the water and the soft substance in the plasma, limb, and also include in tertiary fluid. Uh, next, when we reach our teenage years, our body are already made up of 60% of water. We can see from the picture, uh, the picture is 60% uh, water. And the vital organs in the body are also, also uh, made up of water, like lungs, it is 90% water, and then blood, skin, muscle, brain, and even uh, in the bone, there is also as much as 22% of water. Uh, I think we can call ourselves as a common, right? And um, water has a physiological function such as substrate in metabolic reaction, and structural component in cell formation. An important component in the physiological process of digestion, absorption, and excretion plays an important role in the formation of the structure and function of the circulatory system uh, we call blood and serves as a transport medium for nutrient and all body substance, controls osmotic pressure in the body and maintain body temperature by sweat, for example, and protects body tissues such as uh, the brain and spinal cord, and, uh, and also as a lubricant in spinal fluid, ocular fluid, and synovial fluid. So we can say that water has many health effects, as we heard before from Prof. Kaforas. And now we will talk about water and fluid intake. What factors affect uh, fluid needs? Uh, so there are several main factors that can affect a person's fluid or water intake, such as birth, birth sex, body weight, life stage, diet quality, and of course, activity level. Compared with people uh, born female, those who born male generally need more fluid to support their increased body mass, lower average body fat, and increased calorie burn each day. So male uh, need more water than uh, female. And um, from body weight, as we said before, um, body weight, um, when as body weight increase, the fluid need increase as well. That's why in the obese people, it needs more water than the normally. And in the life stage, like pregnant and uh, breastfeeding women, it needs more water uh, for pregnant to maintain amniotic fluid and keep the baby growing steadily. And in uh, breastfeeding mom, uh, it needs to make enough uh, milk. And then the, from diet quality, uh, from diet quality, uh, we can say when we eat uh, water-rich food like fruit and vegetables and soup, we can meet easier our target uh, of water intake. For activity level, uh, the intensity and duration of exercise affect how much we sweat and uh, subsequent the fluid needs. 
And we can see here uh, some condition that increase a person need for fluid like alcohol consumption that has been explained before from uh, Prof. Kaforas. It has a diuretic uh, effect. So we need more fluid when, we con uh, when someone consume uh, alcohol. And alcohol also reduces uh, vasopressin. Uh, we heard, we hear before about uh, vasopressin is uh, anti diuretic diuretic uh, hormone. Uh, so when it is decreased, uh, when when the when the vasopressin uh, decrease, uh, it will prevent our body from retaining the water. So uh, it will promoting the hydration. And then uh, cold weather, dietary fiber, disease that disturb water balance like uh, diabetes, kidney disease, and then force uh, air environment such as airplane, seal building, heated uh, environment, high altitude, hot weather, high humidity, increase intake of uh, protein, salt, and sugar, ketosis, medication, uh, especially diuretic agent, sickle activity, pregnancy, breastfeeding, uh, this condition increase our, our need of fluid. In Indonesia, we have a reference and guideline uh, about the recommendation uh, water, daily water intake, it is two liters per day or a glass per day. And the source of uh, the water, uh, we can he we have heard before, uh, it is not just from the water itself, but also from food, water-rich food, about 20%. Uh, for example, here uh, it say spinach and watermelon. Uh, it contain uh, 90 percent of water. In line with uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, recommends that uh, women get about 2.7 liters of fluid per day and men about 3.7 liters per day. There, uh, not all of that fluid has to be water intake. Uh, it can from it. It can from uh, nutrient-rich food and beverages like tea, coffee, sparkling water, kombucha, coconut water. And we must remember that uh, the hydration needs are far from one size fits all. We must need, we must be considered like age, gender, health status, environment, and activity level, of course. So uh, there is some formula we use we can use to uh, determine fluid requirement. It is uh, differs between age group. You can see in adult it is 35 milliliters per kilogram body weight per day, and in children it is increased uh, 50 to 60 milliliters kilogram per. Kilogram body weight per day, and in infant it is 150 milliliters kilogram per day, and in lactating woman or breastfeeding mom, it needs um, like the formula in adult plus 600 to 700 milliliters. And when you have disease like fever, diarrhea, vomiting, you need fluid uh, replacement, and kidney disorder or or heart disorder, you need fluid regulation. And then we must know uh, the source of a water intake. As uh, we said before, that the source of water is not from uh, the water itself, but also uh, from food. We can see here um, Chinese cabbage, celery, cucumber. Uh, it has 95 to 99 percent of water, and like. Uh, grapefruit, fresh strawberries, broccoli, tomatoes, it is uh, also more than 90% of water. So we can eat this uh, food 
to fulfill our water need. And from the table, uh, the other table, we can see the light shoes uh, is the first position that have a percentage of water in common food. And then there is a celery, cucumber, cabbage, uh, watermelon. Uh, we, we must know this uh, food so we can choose uh, uh, we can choose a flu, uh, the, the food for fulfill our water need or fluid need. And then next. What will happen if we cannot fulfill the needs of body fluid? So uh, the total amount of uh, water in the body remains relatively constant because uh, the water next water input uh, must be equal to water output. Uh, but uh, we can see here uh, when water input less than water output, it will become water deficiency or dehydration. Uh, otherwise, the when water input more than water output, uh, it can be water intoxication. Water input, uh, the source uh, we, we said before from food, liquids, and uh, also from metabolism. So oxidation metabolism can uh, create uh, water as end product about 20, uh, about 200 to 300 milliliters per day. And water output, we can see here from uh, kidney and feces, uh, it is, we, can, we say that sensible water loss because we can measure that. And from skin and lung, uh, we lose water as insensible, insensible water loss. Uh, first, about the hydration. The hydration happens when the body is losing more fluid and electrolyte than it is taking in. And we don't have enough left for our body to function normally. Next. Uh, there is three, three stage of uh, this dehydration. Uh, we can call it mild, moderate, and severe. Mild when we lose uh, five to six percent of body fluid, and we can feel fatigue, dizziness, and headache. Moderate, we lose seven to ten percent, and at this stage, symptom can be include low blood pressure, dry skin, tachycardia, reduced urine output, and uh, decrease in skin turgor. And when we lose over 10% of body fluid, uh, it will become severe. And because of some electrolyte abnormalities in severe dehydration, people can have seizure and uh, can die. Next. Uh, in, if we do a clinical, um, physical examination, we can find this clinical sign like in the eyes, uh, we can uh, see dry conjunctiva or uh, decrease in tears. In lip and oral cavity, it is dry, chapped lips, and decrease in skin turgor, tachycardia, orthostatic hypotension, decrease central venous pressure, the jugular vein is flat in the supine position, and cardiac dysrhythmia, and also oliguria. When we do biochemical, uh, examination, we will find in blood, uh, there is increase in hematocrit, uh, urium, and osmolality. In urine, we will find a dark color, uh, increase osmolality, and increase specific gravity of urine. In other uh, reference, uh, they divide the, they classify the dehydration into mild dehydration, severe dehydration and chronic lack of fluid. Uh, the cutoff point is 5% uh, of body weight. So when it is uh, less than 5% body weight, it's called mild dehydration. And when it, uh, when it more than 
5% of body weight, it called severe dehydration. And we can see here the symptom and sign like uh, in mild thirst, sudden weight loss, road dry skin, and severe dehydration, it will pale skin, bless lip, fingertip, confusion, shock, shazer, coma, until death. And uh, what happened in a chronic uh, lack of fluid, uh, we can see the symptom or problem like cardiac arrest and other heart problem, and then constipation, dental disease, gallstone, glaucoma, hypertension, kidney stone, pregnancy or childbirth problem, stroke, stroke and urinary tract infection. And otherwise, um, when water input is more than water output, it will become water intoxication. Water intoxication occurs as a result of water intake in excess of uh, the body ability to extract water. The increase in intracellular fluid volume in, is accompanied by osmolar dilution. The increased volume of intracellular fluid causes the cell particularly the brain cell, to swell, leading to headache, nausea, vomiting, muscle witching, blindness, and convulsion with impending stupor. If left untreated, water intoxication can be fatal. Water in, uh, actually, water intoxication is not commonly seen in normal or healthy people. It may be seen in endurance athletes who consume large amount of electrolyte free beverage during event Individ or individual with psychiatric illness or as a result of water drinking contest. So this is not uh, common. We can see uh, the sign and symptom of uh, this intoxication water like uh, periorbital udem, the pulse slow down, the increase of blood pressure, Increased central venous pressure, jugular vein distension, cardiac dysrhythmia, lung congestion, increase of respiratory rate, and also uh, we will found, find uh, crackles in the lung. And then uh, extremity udem. And from biochemical finding in the blood, we will find a decrease of hematocrit, ureum, and osmolality. So, uh, the body has no provision for water storage. Therefore, the amount, the amount of water loss every 20 hours must be replaced to maintain health and equilibrium. Uh, uh, can next? Infant uh, needs more water because of the limited capacity of their kidney to handle a large uh, renal solute load and their higher percentage of body water and their large surface area for, per unit of body weight. And a lactating woman needs for water also increases, uh, like we said before, about uh, 600 to 700 milliliters per day. And thirst is a less effective signal to consume water in infant, heavily exercising, exercising athletes, sick individuals, and older people who may have diminished their sens sensation. Anyone sick uh, enough to be hospitalized, regardless of the diagnosis, is at risk for water and electrolyte imbalance. Older adults are particularly susceptible because of factors such as impaired renal concentrating ability, fever, diarrhea, vomiting, and a decreased ability to care for themselves. In situations involving extreme heat and excessive sweating, thirst might not keep pace with the actual water requirements. So, uh, what what I want to say this: uh, let's drink regularly. Uh, Every, every 20 minutes and don't wait for thirst. This is some tips 
to drink more water. Uh, first, hydrate when you wake up and before meal. Uh, we can try to have about two glasses of water first thing in the morning and then one glass of water before every meal and snack. Uh, and then uh, wrap up your day with another bottle of water. Make sure you have uh, a bottle of water within two hours of waking. Then two hours before bed, uh, finish uh, another. And then we must eat, uh, eat your water by following a produce heavy diet. So we can eat uh, water rich food like fruit and vegetables that have uh, high water contents like cantaloupe, strawberries, watermelon, uh, like we have talked before. Uh, it will help us to meet our daily, uh, our daily intake, daily water intake. And also we can experiment with how our drink, uh, how we drink water, like uh, we can give a different temperature or taste. And also, also we can decreasing the consumption of alcoholic or uh, highly caffeinated and sugary beverage when we felt thirsty. Okay, uh, next about a hydration state. Next, uh, it is a condition that describes the amount of fluid in person body, which can be identified in several ways, ranging from simple methods like thirst rating or urine color determination to technological methods like isotope examination. Okay, uh, this has been explained. Next. So, uh, actually, there are no specific parameters for determining hydration status precisely. So, we need a combination of these uh, following parameters. Like, uh, first, like plasma and urine, urine osmolality. We say uh, it is it is uh, dehydration when uh, it's more than 300 milliosmol per kilogram H2O. And from urine lysis, we can uh, see the simple way like urine color when it concentrated, it is uh, dehydration. And we, we, can, we, can, uh, we can compare the, our urine color with the color chart and we will know uh, what our uh, hydration status. And also urine specific gravity, uh, it's called dehydration when it is more than 1.020. From blood, we can also determine the hydration status from uh, hematocrit and hemoglobin when uh, hemoconcentration, uh, the hemoglobin more than uh, 17 milligram per deciliter, it is uh, dehydration, and when uh, hematocrit more than 50%. From uh, electrolyte status, uh, especially sodium, when it is more than 145 millimol per liter, it, uh, it is dehydration. From blood sugar level, uh, hydration status is considered normal if the blood sugar level uh, less than 140 milligram per deciliter. And from urine creatinine and viscosity, we also can see the hydration status. This is the usual method uh, that um, uh, used for hydration status assess hydration status. Uh, urine specific gravity, uh, it is classified to for, uh, for item like uh, good hydration when the urine specific gravity less than 1.015. And the hydration, uh, as we said before, it is more than 1.020.
and uh, body uh, impedance analyzer also can uh, used to assess hydration status. This method can describe our body composition, uh, include the total body water and also intracellular water, extracellular water, or excess fluid in our body. And it can also um, monitor changes in hydration at certain time intervals. Next, the technical uh, method like isotope tracer also used to assess total body water, extracellular water, and intracellular fluid of different fluid compartment. So this method used the theory of isotope stability, which will always exchange with fluid in the body and is distributed truly in a stable amount as long as the isotope fluid is given. So isotope fluids are given orally and will balance in the body three four to four minutes. After that, the volume of the liquid is calculated. The tracer that are often uh, used are oxygen, G2O, and hydrogen, uh, H2O. The tracer will only distribute it in extracellular uh, volume and detect levels of uh, sodium, chloride, and especially bromide. So, uh, a very, um, unfortunately, there is no gold standard to assess hydration status. Uh, so, clinician must carefully, carefully uh, assess data from a variety source, including physical examination by the medical team, nutrition focus, physical examination, and imaging report, like uh, identifying abnormal fluid. Uh, collection in the within the lung or acid test and also laboratory studies subjective report of symptoms from patient sudden weight loss uh, medication and vital sign in clinical setting it is important to acknowledge all sorts of fluid delivery from uh, oral enteral feeding tube intravenous fluid parenteral nutrition and intravenous fluid given with medication and all sorts of fluid loss, like from urine, diuretic medication, and GI secretion, like emesis, gastric secretion, surgical drains, stool, and fistula. Yes, there is no single way to assess hydration status, so we need a combination. And this is the last uh, uh, slide, I, I'd like to say that uh, good heat hydration keeps uh, our body function properly, uh, lubricant jo lubricates our joint and regulates our body temperature. It is also helps uh, we sleep better, think more clearly, and even puts we in a better, puts us in a better mood. Thank you, and stay heat hydrated and stay healthy. Okay, thank you, Dr. Eka, for a great presentation. Um, next, uh, we have a question, Dr. Eka. Uh, we move to question and answer session, Dr. Eka. May I read the question for the chat box? From Dr. Pinta, I'd like to ask about Ramadan fasting. Um, maybe how the strategy to the fulfill the water intake uh, during the Ramadan fasting. Please, Dr. Eka. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pinta. Um, about Ramadan fasting, uh, we fast for 12 to 13 uh, hours a day, and then we uh, get a breakfast. So uh, to, to fulfill our fluid need, uh, we can, um, we can uh, arrange the, we, we, we should uh, take two liters per day in uh, breakfast to uh, and sahur. Gitu. Uh, and um, 
we we also uh, can uh, get the source of uh, that the source of the water uh, it, it is not only from just uh, plain water you can also take it from the food that water rich uh, water rich food so you can um, uh, fulfill the uh, water need uh, easier so it, uh, if we just from uh, the plain water maybe we can uh, have a bloat bloated maybe you know, but uh, if we um, if we uh, take the other source like the food water uh, water rich food uh, it um, we can we can have enough uh, hydration uh, during Ramadan I think uh, and also uh, we can drink regularly I think uh, regularly so uh, it um, tidak harus uh, sekali minum so you can drink regularly uh, so, uh, to fulfill two liters uh, per day during Ramadan Okay, thank you, Dr. Reka. Uh, for all participants, uh, I would like to kindly remind you uh, to fill the attendance link below the link. And uh, for Dr. Eka, last question maybe. Uh, for the assess the hydration state in the body, what the commonly uh, method is used in clinical uh, practice to to assess the uh, hydration, hydration, hydration state in the body, maybe uh, to assess hydrate, hydration state, uh, uh, like uh, the slide before, uh, there is no single way uh, precisely. So we need a combination, like uh, uh, the simple way can be uh, uh, urine color and combi combine with uh, plasma osmolality maybe or urine osmolality or um, in some uh, research I see uh, the combination is uh, urine color and uh, urine specific gravity so I think uh, um, what uh, we must highlight here that uh, we need combination to see the uh, hydration state. Okay, thank you, Dr. Eka, for the explanation. And we move to last session is photo session for the second speaker. To all participants, please turn on your camera. Um, admin will help me to take the photo session. Okay, uh, one, two, three. Next, one, two, three. Okay, okay. Um, so we we at the end the seminar of medical science seminar series, Faculty of Medicine with Department of Nutrition, Universitas Muhammadiyah Sumatera Utara. Thank you very much for all the speaker and all the participants. And uh, I would like to apologize for all mistakes that I've made uh, of today's event. So I think we'll, I, uh, I will to close the event for today and I will deliver to the master ceremony. To Refika, time is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Amelia Eka. Finally, we get to the last session of the seminar as a MC. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the seminar where we have listened to various exotic knowledge from our excellent speakers. Finally, we get to the last session of the seminar. Let's close this event by saying hamdalah. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. As NMC, thank you so much for Professor Stavros Kabouras and Dr. Eka Febrianti. May what we have conducted will be helpful for us. If in guiding this event, if even 
I have I made mistake. I apologize. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Let's para hang tua orang bijaksana. Panglima saksi negeri Malaka. Kami dari Universitas Muhammadiyah Sumatera Utara. Kampus yang unggul, cerdas, terpercaya. Macam tu, cuba jawab dulu pantun saya ni. Terpana merbah melihat tempua hingga bertengger di atas dahan. Bagaimana budaya tetap terjaga agar tak hilang di telan zaman? Hmm, jawablah mak cik apa lagi? Oh, kejap kejap kejap. Patah kayu dahan bersusun. Meranti jangas bertangkai tiga. Salah satunya melestarikan pantun seperti yang digagas balai pustaka. Luar biasa kali balai pustaka ni, Pak Cik, Mak Cik. Iyalah pula. Katun samba hiasan kebaya, tali bersulam, tenun tersimpan. Pantun kita warisan budaya. Mari bersama kita lestarikan. Ah, kalau macam tu saya jawab pula lah Mak Cik. Ha, ah, sila-sila. Putri termenung berair hujan, menanti hadirnya Panglima Raja. Mari bersatu mengimpun tangan demi lestarinya budaya kita. Hewah, hewah. Selain melestarikan budaya yang kita miliki, kita juga harus memajukan bangsa ini melalui pendidikan Pak Cik dan Mak Cik. Ha, kenapa pula lah macam tu? Kalau begitu, terbang beriring si burung nuri hingga bertengger di dahan kenari. Wahai sahabat bijak berbudi, jelaskan apa guna pendidikan di negeri ini. Ha, kalau Pak Cik tanya macam tu, ini pula lah jawaban saya. Mentari bersinar, alam berseri, berkokok ayam, menyambut pagi. Pendidikan hadirkan karya dan inovasi dalam membangun peradaban negeri. Ha, betul kali yang dikatakan Mak Cik ini. Kalau begitu saya pun ada pantun. Luas terhampar hijaunya padi. Tumbuh sebatang si pohon jerami. Wahai putra putri kebanggaan bertiwi. Kobarkan semangat menggapai mimpi. Eh, saya pun tak mau kalah lah Pak Cik. Ini pantun saya buat untuk kita semua putra putri kebanggaan negeri ini. Ha, macam mana pula tu Mak Cik? Putih berseri si bunga melati. Harum semerbak sepanjang hari. Tuntutlah ilmu sepenuh hati. Agar tak jadi orang. Orang merugi. Setangkai kundur masa di dahan. Dipetik anak di kala pagi. Kau milenial pecinta budaya mengucapkan terima kasih dan sampai jumpa.